Jesus over there. In a box of band-aids. Deterministic predestination type of thing where we're sort of automatons doing whatever it does. No, but there, God's God and God has all sorts of ways of helping us to obey those commandments. Well, as Scrooge says, the spirits can do it all. In one they can, of course that's they right. Can. Nothing's impossible. That's let, right. Let me just suggest that we just found, in a way, a theme for today, which, uh, which is um, the end. And the, I, I would like to just throw out the fact that I mentioned last week that a lot of people believe there wasn't an end, that this was a story about a manic depressive personality right. like Dickens. And Scrooge was going to go back another way the next day. And I think we'll have some further comments about what's built into this ending to suggest that it really is, for the sake of the story, a permanent change. So that may be the question. What, what, thank you, Roy. It, what is the end? Well, in fact, the way that the, the chapter, in fact, the chapter, the, this last stave, in fact, the whole story, right, does not, again, it's, again, it's beautifully ambiguous, right, the end of it, and you take a look at the end of this stave, and in fact, this stave does not end with Scrooge, it does not end with Tiny Tim, it does not end with Bob Cratchit, it ends with, with you, so may it be said of all of us, God bless us everyone. So it actually ends. And if you remember my point long time ago, how many weeks that was 18 weeks ago, I think when we started this, um, that, the, that right, nothing wonderful can come of this unless you understand that Marley was dead. And so from the very beginning, the point of this whole story, the end, in a sense, the end of this story has not been the redemption of Scrooge, although that's important, but it's been the redemption of all of us who read this. And I know in my own heart, and I'll just Again, I was raised Pentecostal, and so I'll have a little testimony service right here. Um, I know in my own heart, reading this text, yet again, particularly reading it in community this year, has been transformative for me. And again, I'm getting weepy right now, so you'll have to start talking pretty soon. <laughs> uh, but this is, it's really been a beautiful heart, heart rending, heart warming uh, um, uh, experience for me, myself. So anyway, somebody else talk. Go <laughs> over here and cry, so. Well, I pulled up the, the beginning of this stave just so we can have it in front of us and we kind of explore from here. Go ahead, uh, Father Casey. Oh, I, I think it actually quite fitting. Uh, you know, one of the things as I reread re through this stave that stood out to me is um, very early, where is it? Um, his sobbing violently. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, that he, uh, as he sort of like emerges out of this um, extended, um, uh, mystical experience that um, that he that these waves these these this flood of um, of emotion sort of just washes over him and manifests in in tears but they are tears uh, and they're not just tears of relief it is it is the initial outburst it's the initial sort of physical outburst of what I think is the bubbling up of joy and gratitude um, and it has just gotten me thinking of, um, of, of how joy um, is, uh, um, well, there's, there's, a great, there's a great line from the theologian uh, Tehard de Chardin that says that um, joy is the infallible sign of the presence of God. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that Scrooge's joy, which is, you know, he, um, it, what does he say? He, um, he frisks. Um, he exults, he laughs, his laughing is almost sort of like, it's just, uh, um, he just is, is giddy. And, um, but his, the first manifestation of that is um, that he just is sort of caught up and he is sobbing um, from his relief and his joy and his gratitude. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's um, the, the transformation that you've mentioned in all of its somatic characteristics, its bodily characteristics, uh, reads like real uh, you know and then you've just given it the sort of that, that it's a physical expression of a spiritual change which is a wonderful way of thinking about it um and it takes us back of course to the beginning when scrooge was a boy himself 
and all of the other kids were going home for Christmas. And in a number of the adaptations that you, Father Casey, have mentioned to us, that's a nice scene. They have the kids coming out of the school and going home, riding horses or taking a cart or something, except in one adaptation where they're all going uh, back to the schoolroom from the city. That seemed the wrong direction. But um, that giddiness, that childhood, even reduced to a baby at the beginning. And it also, of course, is that wonderful passage in scripture uh, about Nicodemus, that, that if somebody wants to read. Sure, let me switch uh, out of this and switch back over to our PowerPoint. There we go. This is from the Gospel according to John, the third chapter. We can't see it. Can't see that? No, we're in the graveyard, which is where we want to be. That's really weird. Let me, I don't know why I switched on my end and didn't, it didn't switch on yours. Let me just, can you see it now? No. No? All right. Bear with me, please. Um, we are experiencing technical difficulties. <laughs> we're all going to laugh. <laughs> All right, here we go. View slideshow, which will start me over. Now, this is from the Gospel of John, yes? <laughs> yeah. uh, and I'll read it and then we can talk about it. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. And I've made a little note on here that there's this wonderful word play that gets all mixed up in this, that the word translated here being born from above is anothen. And it can mean being born from above. It can also mean being born again. Uh, and so Jesus says, you must be born from above. And Nicodemus says, how can anybody be born again? And Jesus says, you got to be born from above or, or you're not going to be saved. <laughs> it's just, you miss all that in English. So I thought I'd, I'd add that. But for purposes of, of the carol and, and Scrooge's rebirth, which we're definitely seeing here in this stave, um, either works, right? He's been born of the spirit and he's been born again, hasn't he? That's right. He's a baby, right? He's a baby. And he doesn't care, right? Okay. And he's a schoolboy. That's right. Yeah. Yes. And, and, and so you remember the ghost of Christmas present uh, spreads laughter through the world when he goes around as a blessing. And, and that laughter, uh, I think the Nicodemus passage is, is kind of funny because Pharisees are hardly ever funny. Uh, and this That's guy right. just can't figure out the biology right. and uh, really, and it, it the point that he can't figure out the biology is exactly what it's about. It's about right. spirit, which is not in the Eric in That's flesh. Right. Isn't that isn't that right? That's right, absolutely. But you can do it with laughter and joy, that wonderful Teilhard de Chardin quotation about joy. Mm. It, 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 yeah. So the, in this oh go ahead. Oh no, go ahead. It's fine. I'll I'll catch up in just a sec. <laughs> so this, uh, this section here where Scrooge is fussing with his garments and remember that his eyes are wet, um, this really delights me and we sort of touched on it, right? There's this outward and visible sign here of an inward and spiritual grace. There's some, something sacramental almost happening with him right now. His hands are busy with his garments all the time turning them inside out, putting them on upside down, tearing them, mislaying them, making, I love this, making them parties to every kind of extravagance. Um, and it, I wonder if he's, stick with me on this, but he has um, three times 
been drawn under something, has been pulled under three times. And in the process, he has died a death to an old way of life. And he emerges from this, these, this threefold diving into something wet and giddy and new with a heart of flesh instead of a heart of stone. And it feels a lot like uh, there's a sort of baptism to a new way of life mm -hmm. here. The, the, the next metaphor, it again, piles a new set of, of, of ideas about making a perfect Laocoon of himself. Yeah. And of course, that was a sacrificial because that was the prophet who was trying to warn uh, his people about the coming of the Greeks. And uh, the gods came down and sent a serpent, a you know, big monster, to take Laocoon and his two, two sons and kill them. So that prophecy couldn't be heard. So uh, it, it's getting you from Greek myth as well as from Christian myth, you know? And it's wonderful because we, we've talked a little bit in, in, in our conversations about allusion, because Dickens very often alludes to other types of things. And here, and I, I made the point last week, and I didn't know it was going to pop up so quickly, but sometimes allusion shows a parallel, and sometimes an allusion shows a difference. Um, and here we have Laokoan, right, who it's a horrible judgment that's put on him. But here, it's almost a comic type of thing. He, he, he's struggling with his pants and his shirts like snakes, and he's getting all tangled up. And so it's, it's, it's an illusion, but it's an illusion sort of showing, showing the joy of this instead of a, a harsh judgment of death. So it, again, it's just a beautiful, um, of all the things that Dickens could have chose, right, could have chosen uh, to show about this type of getting wrapped up in stuff, he chooses this one. So it's, it's, really, I, it's really ironic ironically beautiful. I suppose I'd have to add as well, you know, we saw all these clothes being sold in the rag and bone shop and here they are restored. So it's almost like new clothing is a part of a new body and a new That's spirit. Really and it, to that degree, um, it is Scrooge is not Laocoon mm -hmm. and his prophecy is available for the Troy Trojan to be here. Um, so it's also the reverse, as you say. That's yeah, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. that's beautiful. But but Father Casey said he was going to jump in. <laughs> oh, I was, you know, I, I, I uh, building on this, I, I just continue to be struck that that the transformation is not only about him, um, and 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 this is a, a horse that I I know I beat. It's 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 not only about some sort of um, personal realization in the same sense that um, faith is not only about a personal decision that we make for ourselves that stands alone upon itself and that all that matters is that we have made that decision. Um, but it propels Scrooge out. So what does he do? He doesn't sit there basking in his newfound sort of like revelation and relief. He doesn't fidget his day away. He immediately like runs to the window and speaks to the very first person he sees. And later, my favorite scene in this whole stave is, um, is when it says, um, he went to church and walked about the streets and watched the people hurrying to and fro and patted children on the head and questioned beggars and looked down into the kitchens of houses and up to the windows and found that everything could yield him pleasure. He had never dreamed that any walk, that anything could give him so much happiness. He emerges out into the world and realizes that the world means something completely different to him and that this isn't just about him. It's about every interaction he has with every single person. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, the whole creation is made new, exactly. right? J just like it says in Romans, right? Exactly. So everything is new for him. Look at it. Look at it again in terms of the second stave, or no, the, pardon me, the end of the first stave, when the window goes up and Scrooge sees all the moaning people that are, you know, didn't walk forth in life. And so we've had the same opening up the window in the second stave that takes uh, Scrooge out to Christmas past. And now the window is opened once again on the world of the present. And it is a redeemed world in Scrooge's eyes and feelings as a result of the way he sees again. Mm -hmm. and, and just to, 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 for, for me, go ahead go ahead mother Rebecca. to casey's point there is no fog there is no mist mm -mm. it is clear it it's is clear. bright nature is remade 
Out. The sun is out. Yeah. That's right. Um, in it, it going, it's sort of it's the beautiful, right? Because it's it's a it's a it's a five stave story, right? And so you have the one, two, and three spirit, 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 and then you have the introduction, Marley's ghost, and then the end of it, and the parallels between the first. I feel like we should do this just one more week and go back and read stave one again. <laughs> uh, now that we sort of made the whole circle, because right, remember he meets he meets certain people in that first day, right? He meets his nephew. Mm-hmm. He meets uh, Bob. Well, Bob is obviously there. His clerk is there. He meets the the guys looking for um, for money for the poor. But you remember, he also meets somebody else, and that's the little boy at the door who starts singing, "God bless you, Mary, gentle man." Right. And you notice the very first person, the very first person that, that the very first person that Scrooge in the whole story, the very first person that he wishes that he could have done something different was that little boy. As soon as he sees his own lonely form in that. And you notice the very first person that he says something to, he talks to is yet again, a little boy. You know, and so that that boy at the keyhole and this boy with the turkey uh, is just and the and the and the vast difference. It's a different Scrooge uh, between those two. So here's something that I noticed in his interaction with that little boy. That's that's lovely. And look at this. He says to the little boy, "Do you know the poulterers, the one in the next street at the corner?" And he says. I should hope I did, which is horribly, I don't know, ignorant language, right? Right. He should say, I should hope I do. Mm-hmm. And Scrooge's response is an intelligent boy, a remarkable boy. Exactly, right? exactly. So there is one place where a child is not ignorant. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the role. That's right. But That's redeemed beautiful. with what, That's right. uh, what's under it is redeemed. That's right. Or oh, that's or lovely. Different, yeah. Hmm. It, it's, it's amazing because I, every time I read this, it all seems just very realistic until I recognize what the spiritual shift provides, still keeping everything within the flesh. Hmm. <laughs> this that's is right. just another boy, and yet somehow it's the boy that's under the cloak changed that's right and that's a complete mystery that's right an intelligent boy Mm -hmm. what is the sound uh rippling through the air it's the sound of pealing bells which i just Mm -hmm. love Um, that's right which we've uh, seen obviously right indeed uh dickens is 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 both wonderful at um, creating atmosphere, he, creating a sort of multi-sensory imaginative experience. I mean, you, he throws up in the window and you can immediately just get a sense of the world in its crystalline quality, but also the sort of the peeling of the bells, um, which obviously he is brilliantly creating a scene, but he's also drawing back to the tolling of the bells happening through the night, which is um, such an ominous sound of foreboding it's like um the countdown to his to you know whatever uh punishment is going to befall him next and now it is um it is like the um the the sound of his own heart it is the the sort of exuberance and exaltation of his own soul and so the bells almost are reflective of where he is in the midst of his own process of transformation um, which i love this is bell this is B E L L E. That's right. Two, as we've noticed. And interestingly enough, in Roman Catholic theology, uh, the, uh, in some areas, they w- would say that whenever a soul is saved, the bells will peal. Mm-hmm. And so at least one critic is asked whether this, these bells are singing and ringing so loudly, not just for Scrooge's change, but maybe for something that Marley gets out of this, oh, some of sweet. those other people out for the us. window. For all of us, to Roy's all point, us, about of course. how we are, we are the ones who are invited into this transformation, how the story is really about us. So if that's the case, then the bells must toll uh, in an extended way. May that be said of us and all of us. 
Oh, stop. I'm going to cry again. <laughs> <laughs> it's the cry of joy, though. <laughs> it's beautiful. Yeah. Let's go, can, can we go to the turkey for a minute? Because it's another example of extravagance. Yeah. Um, and yeah. it's the thing that the, uh, the uh, economists at the time uh, criticized Dickens for uh, because somebody had to go without in order for the uh, Cratchit family to have a turkey. And in fact, we don't go to the Cratchit family. We don't see them no, ever having no. more than enough. No. And Dickens got a turkey, an enormous turkey, for Christmas of 1839, which was just four years previously. And he sends a very funny letter um, on the 2nd of January of 1840, saying that that bird had lasted through three gills and four breakfasts and two lunches, and you know, <laughs> there wasn't an atom of something left on it even for breakfast today. So this, for Dickens, at least, there is this enormously complicated sort of feeling about getting that. It is, an, it is a superabundance. And if that's a, a bad thing, no, not here, not now. But um, he was very touched uh, by the fact that he was criticized for the turkey gift. Uh, that really bothered him a lot. It was as if you can't ever let go in this world. I find that to be the epitome of cynicism. I mean, that you would read into this story. I mean, you just talk about hearts of stone. Like, <laughs> the, the, place, <laughs> the place you have to live um, uh, permanently in order to read this story and to interpret that particular element and others as some sort of like, negative, yes, I'm just like, what? How does that, how, where do you, how can you get to that place? And let's That's help right. you, let's help you get out of it. That's the right. next Christmas book tells you exactly that. Uh, and maybe we should do the chimes next year. <laughs> that would be fun. Well, you know, the only sign we get of the enjoyment of this turkey is Bob Cratchit coming late to work the next day. And one saying, thing, just one thing before we get there, just oh, one tiny sure. little thing. And that is what you'll see there right there because it's, it's it comes up two times and that is that when he's writing the address to give to the poulterer the hand in which he wrote the address was not a steady one mm -hmm. and later when he starts shaving he, he, he it's really difficult for him to shave because his hands are trembling and you remember we've seen trembling hands before in fact we saw it last week with the the spirit showing him his and this and the, that hand starts trembling and so yeah. yet again it's just for me at least this is just so beautiful and the way in which dickens again it's an incredibly short stave if you're not going to read anything else read this stave but of course it's not going to make any sense unless you read but it's incredible I, I read the whole thing in like 12 minutes i mean it was it was like it took no time at all but it's so beautiful how little tiny themes from previous ones get interleaved and interwoven into this one just like that trembling hand um so that's he it's almost hmm, it's almost as if scrooge is like an incarnation of all those previous spirits uh, mm. so. remember in the first stage scrooge's hand was good right. for anything he it's, they word name was good but anything he set his hand to, and Dickens added, he set his hand to uh, in, in the after he'd written it out to begin with, and That's it's right. on change. That's on right. change, his hand is good for anything. Mm -hmm. But it meant exchange, and it's the same thing that happens in the first stave, as Rebecca pointed out about not there are no first names. Ebenezer does come up, I think, in the first stave, but Bob is just a coin, you know, fifteen of his own, you know. So that change is all about money, and this change in trembling is all about life. Mother Rebecca, I'm sorry to interrupt, but yeah. That's all right. Here's another example of that. He dressed himself all in his best. We've seen him dressed all in his best. Actually, we haven't. We've seen the best of it, having been removed from his dead body and pawned <laughs> off in a shop, right? And here, he chooses those clothes that's that, that's and puts right. them on. And we know, that, yeah. So yeah. we've seen the shirt before. Yeah. <laughs> There's not any hole in it. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
It is holy, but not <laughs> That's holy. right. Yeah. Oh, no, all gosh. I was going to say, and it, it wasn't to take us to the end, all I was going to observe is that the only thing we ever know about how the, the Cratchit family enjoyed the turkey is that Bob's a little late to work and says he had a little bit of merrymaking. That's right. And, and that's all we ever see about that extraordinary, extravagant turkey. There's no effusive, um, you know, somebody sent us the biggest turkey in the whole wide world. It was just, oh, hum, we just really had an extraordinary right. day yesterday. That's right. right? Yeah, he yeah. certainly doesn't show up and say, thank you, sir, for the turkey, because the turkey would never have come from Scrooge. That's like, that's exactly. in his wildest imagination right. would he have thought that it would have come from his boss. Right. Well, one of our uh, <laughs> listeners, uh, had said something about the, the the Muppet Christmas and oh. that Miss Piggy really nails Mrs. Cratchit yeah. and she does because when Scrooge goes back to the Cratchit household, Miss Piggy just jumps on him <laughs> <laughs> for all his badness and we don't see that scene. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The, um the layering of the spirits on top, how he has essentially become a manifestation of all three, which I think is wonderful. Um, I'm thinking about how time, how, I mean, his line, I will live in the past and the present and the future um, really captures that um, perfectly. Like he is trying to own um, the, the shared experiences of the past, the present and the future. And even now, like when he wakes up, he is lost, like he's totally discombobulated, right? He doesn't know what day it is. He has to ask the boy or the passerby to tell him what, what, what day it is. Um, and the most wonderful thing of all, the thing that m might actually elicit from him the, the sobbing is, is the discovery that it's um, today, like that it's now. Um, and that the redemption that he's been offered, the sort of gift of everything is actually not that he's been sent back to um, fix the things that he did, um, nor is he been like propelled into the future and missed several weeks of Christmas and, um, and, and skipped over it and it really did take a month or whatever, but that he now gets to go right back into his life because the redemption is, is um, the point of it all is now. And um, that the hope of it all is in what he chooses to do from now on. That's right. At the very, the, right, the, 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 wait, the, the, the whole, the, it's called the end of it, but the first, right, yes, and the bedpost was his own, the bed was his own, the room was his own, and best and happiest of all, the time before him was his own to make amends in. But, so. uh, and Mother Rebecca wanted to say something too, and all I want to add is that another way of thinking about that past, present, and future is that Scrooge has recovered his childhood self. Mm -hmm. uh, he mm -hmm. is a child and he brings that child with him now into the present. Uh, not the sad child, but you know, the child that was cared for in the end and the child at Fezziwigs. So he hasn't lost everything in the past either. Right. Right. You know, there's something about the redemption that he's experiencing in the present um, having effect both in the past and into the future. Uh, a little bit like someone we know who might have died on a cross and rose again with effect into the past and into the future. Um, he, and you see, if you read through it, it is so short, but I read through it again and you'll find lots of places where you see him living into the past, into the present and into the future, right? So he, he makes a charitable donation to the guys who came by yesterday, but also there's a, there's a great many back payments yeah. Um, included oh, in that nice. case, right nice. um and and tiny tim who did not die right yeah. so there's a future reaching effect of of his action today so it's, it's sort and of fun it to goes out to father casey's point it goes out into the whole world as good old man as the good old town and any good mm -hmm. old town in the whole good old world mm -hmm. too, which is that redemption that scrooge saw about christmas in the third stage, when they traveled across the whole world and saw miners in Cornwall and lighthouse keepers and people at seeds. Right. Uh, so that's, yeah, Father Casey again and, and, and Rory both saying, you know, this is for us that's right. to, to uh, experience. Yeah. There, I, I, I'm, I keep coming back because I can't shake them, the economists or the <laughs> social commentators who begrudge the big turkey. And um, 
And instead of um, like critiquing the turkey as having taken away from someone else who like deserved it or something, um, I'm really just struck by how the reclamation, I love that word that the, um, the reclamation of Scrooge's soul, I think that's in the first stave, um, uh, is, I mean, like in the first, what, hour of his, um, of his newfound um, uh, uh, heart of flesh, uh, newly implanted, newly uh, graced heart of flesh, um, he is quite extravagant. Um, as, as fast as he can, he is, he is giving away. And I am actually struck by how the reclamation of his soul does involve the, um, the diminishment of his accounts, right? Mm -hmm. Like his accounts are going to get smaller, but that is part of how this becomes healed. Um, it, uh, it's not just in feelings and emotions. It's not just in like goodwill uh, and, you know, sweet thoughts from Tiny Tim. It's also in Scrooge is going to have to like do something different with his, with his checkbook. Right. And isn't it peculiar that mm. Scrooge thought everything he owned was lost in stay four and now he knows that everything he owns needs to be distributed. Uh, and it's, that's another sign that, of this kind of total reclamation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I never knew that until Father Casey taught me that, mm -hmm. Roy taught me that, <laughs> Rebecca taught me. I mean, I, I have to rewrite this chapter, but I've, I've done it enough. <laughs> So uh, Carolyn Lewis has commented to, to your point, Casey, even Judas criticized the woman who used the perfume for Jesus's feet, which is such a great um, parallel with those who would say, how come you wasted so much on that one turkey? Ah, you know, that, nice that's burn, a nice burn, thing. Carolyn. That was excellent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really, really good. And Lane. Uh, and, and actually it's, it's, a, it's a comparable scene um, in uh, Luke's gospel that got me thinking about the sobs of joy when the, um, when the, when the quote sinful woman uh, is weeping and, and anointing Jesus's feet with her tears. Uh, and, and it is, um, they are tears because she has experienced um, the mercy and forgiveness of God in this moment. And what it, what it elicits from her is this manifestation of just emotion, raw emotion, but also a, a physical expression. She does the very, she does the only thing that is possible to her. She she lavishes Jesus with um, with love and and um, and anoints him. Uh, and it's a comparable passage to that one of the woman who uses um, the pound of, of costly perfume. But it just it gets me thinking that you know like you you your emotion then leads you into response. Um, and such a such a profound and tender moment, and and Scrooge is now full of newfound tenderness that had been so at least absent from the way Dickens told him. Mm. And as Rebecca said, to begin with, a, a bathing, a, a, a water cleansing is is there in the washing of the feet with the tears, but uh, here here in, in various intimations. I, 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 Father Casey, because you're bringing up the economists and the and the literary critics who sort of poo-poo this whole story. It's kind of funny is that those those economists and those literary critics actually come in at the end, at the end of it, right? At the end of this stave, right? Um, uh, some people laughed, and this is a nice laughter. This is a mean laughter, right? Some people, some people laughed to see the alteration in it, but he let them laugh and little heeded them because he, he finally, he's no longer ignorant, right? He was wise enough to know that nothing ever happened on this globe for good, at which some people do not have their fill of laughter at the outset. And knowing that such as these would be blind anyway, you see, he's, he's no longer the ignorant one, but maybe those economists and maybe those literary critics, maybe they're just, they, they just refuse to see. They would be blind anyway. He thought it quite as well that they should wrinkle up their eyes and grins as have the malady in a less attractive form. Mm -hmm. So again, they, it's kind of funny that they, they really bother you because it seems as though they probably, they probably perhaps bothered Dickens as well because he has them trot out at the very end. So, Can we go back to the illustration that we just, that's just before that? Yeah. Uh, because 
we, we looked at the illustration in stave one of the ghost of, of Marley's ghost coming into Scrooge's reception room. And this is the same reception room. Now the text just before this says, Scrooge says to uh, Bob that they will, will talk about the future this afternoon. He said over a bowl of smoking Bishop Mm -hmm. um, and then at the top of the next page on the first edition is the next line, which says, meanwhile, Bob, put another coal on the fire and go out to get a new coal scuttle. So I've read this book, you know, for some 70 of my 80 years and always just assumed this was in the office. But it's not. No. It's not. This no. is at home mm -hmm. in the afternoon. And Bob goes out of the office in the morning to get a new coal scuttle. So it's the same fireplace with its petrif petrification of a hearth, but with the kettle steaming and the bowl of punch steaming and the fire steaming, but all encased in a domestic seat. It's not burning down. And Scrooge is on the chair uh, where the ghost of Christmas present was and where Scrooge was. And, um, Bob Cratchit is, is where Marley came in. That's the table that things rested on in all three. And those are the extra uh, bottles of wine. When I looked at this and thought it was in the office, I thought, gee, Scrooge had actually already brought in two more bottles of wine. No, no, no. This is at home where he's restocked. And there's that candle. Uh, it had a face on it. It doesn't have a face now, but it's really shining a light through the room. It's almost as, as bright in it, obscuring even the details of the background as was the cap of Christmas past. And it looks like there's decorations. There looks like there's holly or there's holly that, that, that yeah. if left behind by the ghost of Christmas That's present. Right. Is that beautiful? So, so yeah. this is a picture of the transformed room. Now in the third stave, it was a surprising transformation that took place with a spirit. Hmm. But here the spirit is in the flesh and in the reality of the room. And it is a transformed room. I think that's and another it's... way this insists uh, on the existence of that transformation in a more permanent way. And it's and if, if you can see my camera, it's, it's, the, um, it's the ghost of Christmas present and he has his feet in exactly the same position. Um, it's up on that. So it's just a, it's just a beautiful, I mean, he becomes, he, yet again, he becomes the incarnation of Christmas present. Oh, yeah. oh, I don't have. And that's that. what that, so that paragraph is about: how his influence extended as far along as the ghost of Christmas present did when he was sprinkling joy, joy, joy to the world. <laughs> uh, now that may be material joy, but of course it was also the joy of the birth of the Savior. Yeah. Oh, and to know that Dickens had—I mean, that—that that is not an accidental. Um, Leach didn't pay, didn't Leach didn't draw that accidentally. He probably consulted with Dickens, and so the scene with Cratchit that's in that's totally intentional. I love that. Uh, I, I, that's right. And I, I, I there was a wonderful article written two decades ago in the Yale Life, uh, Library Chronicle, and I didn't get it until recently. And so somebody's jumped on this and and its importance as the transformation of that room and that spirit. Um, before me, but it's it, yeah. It, it, Leach and Leach got it in this book. Leach makes a huge number of mistakes in later books, puts people into the scene that don't belong there and were never there. And I can excuse that by saying, well, that's what the reader believed that there was that person in that scene. But here, Dickens must have known the end of it from the beginning for Leach to be able to make that sequence of images of a transformation. There he is, yep. So definitely these decorations mm -hmm. that are there at the end mm -hmm. are still, still there, there from the visit. Yeah, that's and Actually, the, the, the uh, fireplace, I think, has there's scenes in those tiles. Mm -hmm. I've forgotten what it said precisely about those yeah. scenes. They're biblical scenes. Yeah. So when, when we get to the end um, of, I, it? of it, <laughs> I think the, what, the, the only ending is the ending to us. 
of this reading, but not the ending of the effect of this reading. And uh, I, I, I don't know much, how much time we have left, but when we're getting close to the end, I just want to point out two other little things in the very last sentences. Is that okay? We yes. have five minutes, so now's the oh, time. All right. Well, maybe somebody in the audience will want to say something. Um, he had no further intercourse with spirits, but lived upon the total abstinence principle. That's a joke about alcoholism. And it was always said of him, always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well if any man alive possessed the knowledge. May that be truly said of us and all of us. There's the individual and then the, the reader, us, and then the whole of us, and then the brilliant last words. Mm -hmm. And so as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, every one. And sometimes that is every single person distinguished. And sometimes, especially in the adaptations, God bless us, everyone, the whole. And everyone works both ways. So Dickens can get you with an individual and with everybody in the world. And again, just going back to that first stave, right? When that little boy bends down at that keyhole, he does not sing, God rest ye merry gentle men. He's, he sings, God bless you, merry gentle man. The exact same thing that Tiny Tim says at the very end. And mm -hmm. so yet again, a beautiful bookend. Um, and, and by the end of the book, he, Scrooge is blessed. And I would say we all are, right? So. Is it, is it COVID this year that makes this message even more for some of you personal than maybe other years? I, I, I just have a different feeling about, partly because of our conversation, but mm -hmm. partly mm -hmm. somehow this hope has been so lacking this year in our, our future hopes and it, it seems a real message of the present for me. I, uh, I read an editorial in the <laughs> Times yesterday, maybe, um, uh, that talked about that, that this precise thing, that really? in the midst of this year, a Christmas Carol is one of the only things that has maintained its firm hold on our collective societal imagination, and that performances and um, adaptations and the sort of collective um, embrace of the story uh, is um, is perhaps stronger than ever. So, it, talking about the times, there's a, there's also an editorial about what is death, and I know we want to end on a high note on this thing, but it is an interest, right? The thing that actually causes him at the end to change is, you know what? Mm -hmm. And at the end of this editorial, I was going to mention this. Um, so the question is, what is death? If in the editorial. Um, writer says, if I had to answer the question today, I would say that for me, death is when I can no longer engage with the world around me, when I can no longer take anything in and therefore can no longer connect. At times, social distancing has me wondering if there are, I, I'm there already, but that's just me missing people that I care about. There are still ways to connect with others, including the bittersweet act of missing them. Um, Dick there you go. About with every New Year's or in every Christmas, the dead are with you to be remembered, mm -hmm. lamented, and brought in again into the fold. Mm -hmm. And the, this book I'm mysteriously writing and I hope will get published is called Dickens, Death, and Christmas. Mm -hmm. And I started writing it well before COVID, but maybe it was a prophetic uh, impulse on my part. Mm -hmm. because to begin with, Marley is dead, was dead to begin with, yeah. raises all the questions about what kind of an end there can be after that. Yeah, mm. that's right. Mm. Uh, it's, it's kind of funny, right? You begin with the end. Um, it, in my own copy, right, I have this stupid thing marked up like a Bible. Um, but, but yeah, Marley was dead to begin with, and I just have written, begin with the end. And what's interesting is that, in fact, you end, in a sense, you end at the beginning, because as soon as we close the book, that's when this actually has, has a beginning in our own lives. So. Yeah. I, 
I just finally connected the dots of, of uh, Dickens's life and realized that he was only about 30 years old when he wrote this. Mm -hmm. Only one to go. Um, I am, I marvel at that, um, that relatively early in his, I mean, mm -hmm. in his literary career that he was able to sort of summon this level of understanding. Um, and I mean, this is no knock on people who are 30. I, my 30 year old self <laughs> probably hated me saying any of this, but um, I just really marvel at how he wrote this story at that stage in his life. And let me tell you, he did some of the most bitter, sarcastic, Swiftian uh, publications at this very same time, furious with all the churches, Protestant, Roman Catholic, non-denominational, that wouldn't get together to teach simple things to children collaboratively so that they would grow up with some kind of spiritual and moral education. Uh, and, and he just raked people over the coals. I, I can't even read it here, but um, he, he, he compares the University of Oxford to a manufacturing plant and says the manufacturing plant takes care of its people better than the University of Oxford does. Mm. Uh, and they're just, they're in, stuck in 500 year old ignorance. Mm -hmm. So the goodness that comes in this is, is not without all those other pressures in him yeah. that get transformed in the very writing. And yet when he summons when he summons something different from within his own experience. And I would say um, that there is, there is definitely something um, providential. Um, there, there, is, there, is, there, is, there is something that transcends Dickens' own self yes. that is imbued in this. Um, when he's able to summon that or be a vessel for that, um, look at the timelessness of this story in 2020 in the midst of this particularly awful crisis hear these words, not his, not his biting satirical critiques of, you know, 1840 England, um, not his, you know, later works and perhaps his, his more um, uh, esteemed literary works, but this particular little novella is the one that continues to hold us um, enthralled and to inspire and provoke us. That's why it's included in the Bible. Indeed. Yes, the holy writ of Roy Heller. But it's, but it's after Revelation. <laughs> <laughs> we'll end on a high note. Right? This so, has yeah. been Thank such you, a uh, joy and a delight as, as we've said several times. Thank you for coming along uh, for this series oh, yeah. of conversations that we've had. Bob and Roy especially, thank you for giving of your time these, you. these several weeks. Um, it is, I am aware of the time and aware that uh, Father Casey and I need to be, um, we need to, we need to play with our clothes and make a uh, lacoon okay. <laughs> <laughs> really quickly so we can get outside. Um, so let's just end with God bless us, everyone. Amen. Goodbye, Beautiful. friends. Bye, everybody. Bob, thank, uh, thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you all. Take care. Bye-bye.